fourth Sunday after Epiphany, and our theme for today is what sort of man is this? And we begin with that. Almighty, 
our Lord's deity. Their purpose was educational, but it was also to prove his divinity. Men had wrong ideas about God. Their concepts needed to be purified and exalted. The object of Christ's miracle was therefore not only to show his power, but grace. And when we consider his power, we are to see that it was used to save what is good and destroy what is evil. We need not fear the almighty power of God and his love, but rather rejoice that we have that love. Our first lesson then, God had just announced his anger against Israel, but now he introduces his unexpected words of love. Our first lesson is from the Old Testament reading from Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 3. But now, says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, they will, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba in your place. Here ended our first reading. In the epistle lesson, we have a summary, the commandments, which sum up this sentence, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It reveals the all-prevailing inspiration that we are to have obedience to the law, and the law of Christ is revealed and lived by him. The heart possessed by the real power of love for Christ <coughs> holds that love and manifests Christ in every relationship of our life. The epistle lesson for this, the fourth Sunday after Epiphany, is written in the book of Romans, chapter 13, reading verses 8 through 10. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another is filled, fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Here endeth the epistle, and we join in the gradual. Alleluia. Oh, praise the Lord, all you nations. Laud him, all you peoples, for his merciful kindness is great towards us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Obey him. 
Here endeth the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And what does the Bible teach about then Jesus descending to hell? The Bible teaches that Jesus descended to hell. 
is that after coming to life in the grave, Jesus descended into hell, not suffer punishment, but to proclaim victory over death and the power of the dead. And then why is this resurrection of Christ such an important comfort to us? The resurrection of Christ definitely proves that Christ is God's Son. That he has made full satisfaction for all my sins, and I too will rise up in the last day. He gives me strength to forsake my sin and live a new life. And how do you receive all the benefits of Christ's redemptive work? I receive this when the Holy Ghost creates in my heart a living faith for Christ is my Savior. And we say in Galatians 4, 5, when? When the time had fully come, God has sent his Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem, to redeem all my sins. No, to redeem those under the law. Under the law. That we might. That we might. This ends our examination and we'll continue with our
And just like you answered the disciples, you will answer our prayers. When danger threatens and our hearts tremble, remind us of your presence and your power to work all things for our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text is written in the 8th chapter of Matthew, again reading verses 23 through 27. We read as follows in Jesus' name. <clears throat> now when he got into a boat, the disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves. But he was asleep. When his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is true. Does this sound familiar? Our life together as Christ redeemed in the boat of his church, where he is keeping us safe? Then it's easy for us to answer the disciples' question correctly. But we just don't see God anywhere, do we, at times? He invited us into his presence today where he sits at the right hand of the Father in the kingdom of heaven. He said, come to me and I will give you rest. But where is he? All we need is to look and see what's going on around us. And, and we say, can he see all our trouble? Then we think about ourselves. We think, I'm following the Lord. I go to church almost every Sunday. I give my offerings. I read the Bible and I pray almost every day. I'm doing everything you ask me and it seems that you have gone to sleep, Lord. Don't you see that there's wars? That there's people starving? There's homeless people wondering where their next meal is coming from? There are those who don't have a job and others that are suffering from some illness or incurable disease. And when all these things are happening, then it's not so easy to answer the disciples' question, what sort of man is this, which is our theme. Even our churches are struggling with fewer members to the point where not enough members are willing to stand up and serve in the Lord's house. It may seem that we are drowning and our boat is being torn apart, and yet we don't see Him. But God is not asleep, any more than God was sleeping in that boat with the disciples that day. Jesus, the man, was sleeping. He had to, because He had taken on our human flesh for us. He had not yet taken that flesh to the cross and died so that in his state of what we call humiliation, he got tired, and that's why he was sleeping. He had been out walking around with his disciples, preaching and healing all members of diseases, and it took away his energy, and so he was asleep. But God wasn't. Dear fellow redeemed, God answered the disciples when they called upon him, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. The flesh of Christ, God in the flesh, did wake up, and so they would know that he was God and that it was God answering their prayers. He called to the sea that day because his time had not yet come. His time to die on the cross for us. And since he was with the disciples in the flesh, he had to get to shore. His time had not yet come. Well, God does similar things with us. 
Though we don't see them for the spectacular things that they are, God answers us in and through his boat, the church. And he does this with ordinary stuff like water poured on us. To forgive you all your sins, like preaching the word and proclaiming the forgiveness of sins in absolution, like bread and wine placed on your lips. And because God works through these things called the means of grace, he points us to these things because he doesn't work, uh, he doesn't save us apart from them. So we also act like the disciples and say, what kind of man is this? God gives us his word and then promises attached to it, the power that's attached to it. And when you hear his word, the Holy Spirit takes these things and through faith opens heaven to us. Calvary and Emmanuel Lutheran churches, the whole Christian church on earth, it is earthly, visible form. It is sometimes referred to the boat, surrounded by storms and filled with anxiety and angry quarrelsome people like the disciples. And you and I haven't even left anything behind like they did. We are even more surrounded by the world than they were. And so it's no surprise that storms in our life happen on a daily basis, whether you see them or feel them or notice them or not, we are in the midst of a storm. Sometimes these storms happen in our life because it's a sinful world full of sinful human beings. And what do sinful human beings do? But they hurt each other. And in a sinful world full of sinful human flesh who hurt each other, sinful, dreadful, deadly things happen all the time. Sometimes even as a result of our own personal sinful behavior. Things that we just insist on doing end up being harmful to us. And though that is not even very frequent the case, it does happen. So smokers die because they smoke. People die because of car crashes, because they drove too fast, or were on their cell phones, or under the influence of some drug. And sometimes it is our own sinful behavior that causes those storms. Sometimes the storms in our life happen because of the sinful world or its prince, the devil, who is actively trying to tear you and me away from God. Trying to prowl and devour us or cause us to become angry with God, to turn away from Him or simply ignore Him and His Word or even to hear it and then dismiss it as unimportant. And sometimes our storms are even God sent, like the storm seems to be here in the reading from Matthew. <clears throat> Paul also talks about a kind of storm that, a kind of storm that was sent to him as he talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 7. So to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, that he had been given by Christ to give to the people to keep him from being conceited from talking too much about his faith <laughs> and too much about what he does rather than what Christ did to keep him from being conceited and he has given me a thorn in the flesh a messenger of Satan to harass me again to keep Paul from being conceived. So think about this. Do you understand that the message of Satan to cause physical storm in his life, some kind of problem in his flesh, 
was a messenger from Satan that was actually sent by God. And so that storm that day, and so we can't even tell them these things that are troubling us and what they are. But sometimes God sends those things to us to keep us from being conceited, to drive us to our knees. So to say, save us, Lord, we are perishing. Because if we don't realize we're perishing, we don't ask Him to save us. And when we do realize it, and we do ask Him, guess what He does? He saves us. Because we know, Paul also writes, we know that for those who love God, that is, those who have faith in Him, the ones who love us, the one who saves us, those that have faith, all things work together for good to those who are called according to His purpose. Even thorns in our flesh like cancer, accidents, or sickness that take loved ones, even things that seem to be tearing our church apart. So Paul again says in Romans 8, 35 through 7, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Trouble or hardship or danger or sword? No, in all these things we believers, we the baptized, we who hear God's word, we who feast on his body and blood, we in all things are more than conquerors through him who loved us and gives us these things to show and give his love. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor death nor anything else. You fill in the blanks with anything that's going on in your own life shall keep us from the law of Christ. The bottom line in all this is our gospel today. And it says Jesus wanted his disciples to call on the name of the Lord. His name. A name of the Holy, of his Father, of himself, of the Holy Spirit, just like people did on Paul Sunday. In our text, the disciples said, Save us, Lord. On Palm Sunday, when Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the people say, Hosanna, save us now. Save us now. Lord, for we are perishing. And that's all God wants us to know. And always keep in mind. Yes, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are perishing. But He never sleeps anymore since he's risen to the right hand of the Father. He doesn't have to sleep. And he knows the storms around the corner that you haven't even thought of yet. For as worrisome as the storms that you and I are now going through, think of how much grief God saves you from by not revealing what is to come and the things that have been avoided by God. No, Jesus doesn't sleep anymore, but he does, doesn't have to. But he does allow storms to happen. And when we don't know where to look for him, it may appear that he's sleeping and doesn't care, but that's just because of our spiritual blindness or our unbelief. And all he wants by these things is for us to do the same as the disciples did. And just like he answered the disciples, he will and does answer us today. He addresses our greatest needs as they arise in the way that will help us the most. Isn't that why you're here today? To call on the name of the Lord? The name placed upon you in your baptism. The name of the one true God who opens heaven for you. Every time you call upon him for whatever you call upon him, saying his name, save me, Lord, I am perishing. He does just that. And he is even doing it right now. He is answering 
prayers for all of you. Through his called and ordained servant of the word. Who is here to forgive you all your sins through absolution. To guide you to his grace. To calm all the storms of your life. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God which passes all our understanding. Keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Oh Lord, 
We also ask you to be with those who have suffered a loss of a loved one, and especially in the aftermath of this meaningless, in a meaningless loss of life, those who are suffering, those who have lost family members and friends, and those who are heavy with sorrow, angry, stressed, lonely, and in need of your love. For you alone can give comfort and healing. And at times when we feel alone and empty, we forget that you alone have given the promise of forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. Yes, Lord, be with us. Keep us in your love and the assurance of our salvation. Comfort our grief, dry our tears, and console our sorrow. Give us all the peace that surpasses all understanding. All this we ask in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory.
make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Good morning.
what you want to do with the cabinets, and then we'll discuss it and make up our minds at the council meeting. The old cabinets, what you want to do with them. And then there's plenty of cardboard boxes if anyone likes to want to lay on in your garage or whatever. Help yourself. There's a pile of them there, so please take one if you want it, because you want to get rid of that and stuff. Uh, as far as the kitchen, it's pretty much done except the uh, trim has got to go on the bottom of the cabinets and then the floor and then uh, the electrician is supposed to come in this week. So the plumber's been here and all of those things. So it's moving along that. Also then, note the uh, uh, new church council positions there that you can see and then positions remaining to fill. So if anyone is interested in any of those things, please let myself or Kevin know. Um, and also, we noticed that great blessing there. This week, Emmanuel received a check in the amount of $4,783 from Arliss Freusland Trust. And what a wonderful gift that she left for the church that she grew up in. And we thank the Lord then for that. Um, also, notice the letter back there from uh, our seminary student that we... Uh, that we uh, sponsor, especially the second page is where he wrote out how thankful they were uh, for all of the gifts they gave to you. Is there any, oh yeah, upcoming events, next Sunday then we'll hold a special meeting, the ICW elect officers, all women of the congregation are asked to attend, and then the winter youth retreat is coming up the following week. Is there any other announcements that need to be made? Boy, it says they gotta go because they're falling apart. So if you want one, help yourself. Okay. Anything else? <clears throat> Nothing else. Well, as you noticed, Marina and I will be gone this week. I had it someplace in here, I believe. Yeah. So if you need pastoral service, call one of the elders or Pastor Gene Lillian Paul from Langby. Or if someone happens to go to the hospital in Fargo, the pastor from the Wells congregation in Moorhead knows about it. That we go on to, so his number is there if you need anything. Nothing else, may God's richest blessings then go with you.